Hello, I'm Glenn Hodgson. I'm an economist based in Ottawa. My career has spanned uh, Department of Finance with the federal government, the Conference Board of Canada, where I was chief economist for 12 years, expert development in Canada, and the International Monetary Fund in Washington. And I'm here today to talk about the impact of uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, on the global outlook. And I'm going to start with a review of where we were until about three weeks ago and then talk about the specific impacts of the, of the pandemic. So the overall forecast for 2020 was fairly modest. It was showing a little bit of growth, but not really strong. And global output was being constrained by turmoil. Donald Trump was the main cause of the turmoil. The US-China trade dispute was a key factor, but even things like arbitrary intervention into steel and aluminum markets with trusted trade partners was disrupting the global economy. And of course, we could add in everything from Brexit to uh, wars in the Middle East, which are always there as, as risk factors. But COVID-19 has added an, another layer of uncertainty, and clearly there are deep impacts already being felt in key sectors. Uh, we saw the impact already in hospitality, tourism, the airlines. Uh, it's rippling uh, into other parts of the economy. So the forecast is changing very rapidly. And the consensus view now, and I've, I've taken the time to read most forecasts in Canada, few in the United States and internationally, is that a recession is the most likely um, outcome or scenario for 2020. It'll be deeper in Q2, so from April to June than in, in, in the first to third quarter, but it'll probably span three quarters. The hope is that if we get the pandemic under control, recovery will begin to emerge in the, in the last quarter of the year. So after, uh, after October, we'll start to see growth uh, uh, return. And when it returns, it'll return in a great gush because of pent-up demand and because firms have slowed down their investment during this and actually sort of cut their, their staffing and their output. The added complication for folks in Newfoundland and Labrador, of course, is a, is a sharp drop in oil prices. And this is gonna hammer cash flow in the oil sector have a big impact on the provincial budget, probably limit the capacity of the provincial government to add, add stimulus and, and to sort of help out sectors of the economy. But I'll talk about that when I get there. So there's the overview. Here's a quick look at what the global outlook looks like. This is kind of a, the, the way economists look at the world. And the overall story is that growth is very uneven across regions. So you see how weak it is in Japan, how strong it is in the rest of Asia, but also global economic growth is slowing over the, over the three years covered here. We are expecting growth of about 3.2% this year. It's gonna be nothing like that. In fact, the OECD just released a forecast yesterday um, calling for a recession in 2020, a mild recession, but a recession that, nonetheless, we didn't have a recession globally during the global financial crisis 10 years ago. So it gives you a sense as to how dark things will become very quickly. China is where the, the pandemic started. Um, forecasters were already expecting China to, to slow down this year below 6% growth. You can see that China's had a spectacular run for the last 35 years. You know, growth in, ex in excess of 10% a number of years. But it's, it's gr gradually been slowing due to a much deeper capital base. It's harder to sustain the same rate of economic growth if your economy keeps broadening and deepening. And of course, China also has a, dem a demographic issue, aging population. So the, the forecast going into the year was for China to slow below 6% growth. They will have lost the first quarter. They're, China will probably end up having a deep recession um, with contraction of, say, 5 to 10% in the first, first quarter this year. But there's also signs emerging already of a recovery in China. Stores are opening, more normal activities taking place. Of course, trade is being disrupted. So the number for China in, in 2020 will be much lower, maybe growth of somewhere between two and 3% for the year, and a recession maybe in the first part of the year. The United States in, in 2020 appeared to be doing well on the surface. <clears throat> the US has had really impressive job growth for a, a decade now and good private investment, but they were really living on a sugar high from the tax cuts that Trump introduced two years ago. That provided kind of a gush of fiscal stimulus. That's now fading, and it was expected to fade quite sharply in 2020, uh, 2020 and growth to slow to about 2% with rising public debt. And of course, the trade disruption I've already talked about is a key factor why the US economy was also slowing down. And then on coronavirus is hitting on top of that, and quickly the United States seems to be turning into the epicenter of the, of the pandemic. New York State in particular is being hit very hard. 
and um, New York is a financial center for the United States for big chunks of the global economy. So if something really acute happens in terms of public health risk, uh, mortality rates, and the knock-on effects of the economy in New York, it'll be hard for the United States to, to come back. We'll have to be healing, both physical and financial, for a recovery to happen. Um, in terms of the fiscal deficit, just to show you, the United States was getting ready to borrow a trillion US dollars this year to fund basically the Trump tax cuts. Uh, you know, when you cut taxes and no cut spending, you end up with big deficits. And this just shows you how deep the deficits are, where they were already expecting um, to borrow a trillion dollars. The US Congress just voted in, uh, I think overnight, a, an aid package of 2.2 trillion US dollars. And that will be felt almost immediately. So that's gonna be felt this fiscal year into next fiscal year. So we shouldn't be at all surprised that the United States goes out and borrows $3 trillion over the next year to fund its federal government. That shows you how, how severe the impact is on the, on the global economy and the US economy. And this is all to kind of build a floor under the recession, to provide financial assistance to affected individuals, to sectors that are really being hurt, uh, ideally to, to fund the healthcare system, although the US seems to be responding very slowly to the pandemic. Uh, and then we'll have to find our way after that. But there's no question, no one's even talking about the level of debt right now. The whole focus is on dealing with the health crisis and also trying to kind of shore up the US economy and position it so it can actually grow again later in the year. And this shows you the growth forecast sort of pre-pandemic, where growth had slowed from 2018 to 2020. Um, and this year, we shouldn't be at all surprised to see a recession in the United States so between half percent, one percent, or even more, depending upon the severity of the shock. For Canada, we were also forecasting a uh, sustained growth, but not really robust. Our economy was being held back already by high levels of consumer debt, by probably five or six week, years now of weak business investment, and also by the oil production restraints in Alberta, where Alberta decided to actually cut production as a way to boost its price. But on top of that, the turmoil in, in international trade and investment was also a, a big factor for our economy. Uh, our trade negotiators, trade negotiators deserve a lot of credit for having gone to the table with the Americans and come back under NAFTA two with a deal, which is probably a small negative for our economy, but it's far better than not having a deal. So we kind of preserved our access to the US market through that negotiations. Um, but the, all these factors together were pointing to a fairly sort of not very sexy growth rate for Canada in 2020 of around one and a half percent with big differences amongst the regions. And so, so here's a picture of what the outlook was for Canada. Um, early part of the year, you see growth a little bit stronger in 2020, but, but really not robust, only one and a half percent. And I'll spend a bit of time on the provincial outlook. I've, I've taken this slide uh, from a composite of what my colleagues at the Conference Board of Canada have done, where I mentioned I was chief economist for 12 years, so I, I know how the numbers are produced. I have a lot of confidence in the numbers, but also confirming that with some of the bank economic shops, uh, particularly Scotiabank. And I'll point to, first of all, Newfoundland and Labrador, growth of 1.2% being forecast of the year. Not really impressive, but against a potential growth rate, meaning growth without inflation of around 1.5%. So not that far from potential, also quite similar to most of Atlantic Canada you can see that most of the Atlantic Canadian provinces have growth in, in, in the same range. Central Canada, a little bit stronger, but not much. Alberta and BC, the growth leader. Alberta, a recovery from a recession in 2019. We don't have the final numbers yet, but because oil production was cut and because of other factors that pulled back in investment, um, general projection was for Alberta to have a recession last year. So growth of 2.3% sounds pretty good, but that's based on a smaller economic base because of the recession. Saskatchewan may also have had a recession uh, for the same reasons, because their, their oil price was, was, was being cut. And BC has been the growth leader for a long time. And that, this, of course, will all change now with the coronavirus. Uh, we should look for most, if not all, provinces to be facing a recession in 2020. And then in terms of debt levels, and this is also important for Newfoundlanders, you can see that um, Newfoundland and Labrador has the highest debt ratio, so government debt as a share of the economy, at about 55% of GDP. Um, the feds by comparison are at 30% and had been falling 
Taxpayers, of course, pay both federal and provincial debt. So that's a heavy debt burden for taxpayers in Newfoundland to be carrying. Most other provinces are doing things to actually reduce the debt burden. Quebec, for example, used to be the highest at 51%. They've, they've done things largely containing health sector costs to bring their debt ratio down, actually balance the books. Ontario, unfortunately, is going the other direction, seeing a higher debt ratio because we haven't balanced the books on Ontario in at least a decade now. So a very different story, but Newfoundland Labrador included the most exposed. Um, debt service as a share of the provincial budget is about 14%. So that's not crushing, <clears throat> but any drop in performance of the economy, any pullback in revenues, there then exposes that ratio. It, it'll go higher. So there, there will be pressure on Newfoundland in terms of debt management going forward with the imp combined impact of the coronavirus pandemic and the impact of what's happening in global oil markets right now. So I'm gonna shift gears here and now talk about <clears throat> the economic shock being provided by the coronavirus, by the COVID-19. Um, the combined forces are uncertainty, which is causing everybody to stop, businesses to stop and think hard about investing, where they're gonna do business development, why would they expand their business model in a time of great uncertainty? And of course, there was a direct impact on demand in a lot of sectors. It started with tourism, hospitality, airlines. It has then spilled into in-store retail as we've gone to social distancing and actual sort of mandatory closures. So most provinces have now moved to the point where retail, whether it's uh, food service, shopping, whatever is being shut down, except for real essentials like grocery stores, um, pharmacies. Ironically, the, the booth stores in those provinces are still open. And there's even some spilling into manufacturing happening. We've seen announcements from the major auto manufacturers, from aerospace, from a lot of assemblers, that they're setting, shutting their production lines out because they just can't see the in demand to buy their goods. So that's having a real sort of downward effect on their economy. And I think the most likely scenario now, and I've taken the time to look at all the forecasts, is that we're going to face a deep recession in Canada that will last three quarters. And there, but there will be a recovery late in 2020 if we can bring the pandemic under control. That's the key factor. So the social distancing is critical to stop the migration of the virus, bring it under control. And we're bringing it under control in part to control the mortality rate, but really to ensure that our healthcare system can be sustained through this, that we actually have a low, a low enough uh, rate of cases that they're still manageable within the healthcare system. Um, you know, I live a, an hour from the US border from New York State. And watching Andrew Cuomo on television is, is sad right now because he's desperately trying to build the capacity of his healthcare system. So if there's any one place in North America that's going to feel the shock most acutely, it's going to be New York State. There may be other, other U.S. states uh, like Louisiana, like Florida, that'll have after effects. But I think we have to watch carefully what's going on in New York and whether they succeed in actually kind of stopping the growth of the virus, the spread of the virus, and be able to sort of maintain it within their healthcare system. I have to say that this is a unique period we're going through right now. There will be negative effects uh, for the economy. And then for oil producing regions like Newfoundland, Labrador, Alberta, Saskatchewan, there's the added threat. And I did a commentary just released yesterday for the C.D. Howe Institute on this, where oil prices are basically collapsing. And it actually starts with a coronavirus in China. So prices began falling kind of early February, mid-February, as the Chinese economy slowed down, went from growing at five and a half percent to basically being stopped and contracting quite sharply in February. OPEC then stepped in, and as they tried to do in the past, they tried to reduce overall production to kind of shore up the price, to improve the price, to make sure it doesn't fall. But Russia resisted that, didn't want to play along. <clears throat> and in fact, we're now to a point where you can see kind of a competition between Saudi Arabia and Russia for who's gonna be the, the key influencer, who's gonna be, not the, just a swing producer, but who's actually gonna determine the overall level of oil production and therefore the price going forward. The Russians have huge ambitions to step into oil production. Uh, Putin's already rolled out plans for $150 billion of new capital investment in, in, in Siberia to increase Russian production capacity. And so you can see this battle for supremacy right now. They both have the taps on. The Saudis, Saudi production is up to 13 million barrels a day. It, it had been sort of 10, 10 and a half before. The Russians have the tap turned on as well. And the consequence is a gusher of oil driving down oil prices. 
On top of that, with the pandemic, we now should anticipate that global oil demand is going to decline in 2020. Rather than going by about a million barrels a day, it was, was forecast, it may fall by three to five million barrels or more, depending upon how long the, the recession period is. So that's really bad for oil prices. So the WTI price, which is the North American benchmark price, has been below $25 a barrel the last uh, week. The Western Select price that's paid for Alberta and, and the Saskatchewan oil is, has been as low as $7 a barrel, which is a shockingly low, low level. And at the gas pump, there are people in, the, in this country who are paying 63 cents a liter for gasoline. So this is great for consumers, but truly terrible for the industry and the regions that are affected, including your province. And of course, looking beyond the short-term crisis, there's also structural change happening in global oil demand where the International Energy Agency is now forecasting that global, global demand for oil may plateau as early as 2025. And part of that's because renewables, um, electricity from solar, from wind, from other sources, has quickly become much more price competitive. And there's a shift in consumer preference going on right now, where, for example, electric vehicles are still a small share of the global oil market or, or, or the global auto market. But that share is going to grow. All the producers have signaled that they're going to make a lot more EVs, a lot more plug-in hybrids as a transition. So we have to be aware of that structural change coming as well, which is not a short-term factor, but will be a factor influencing the recovery, for example, in Alberta, whether they can actually anticipate to have the increased production that they've been planning upon. So what happens next? Well, I've done some research on this. As a, I'm a fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute right now, and I've done some research, and the what the media is not telling us right now is that past pandemics have not just been one wave. They've, they've been a series of two or three waves. Um, and the, the pattern, whether we have one or two waves of the current pandemic, is going to depend on country resp responses. If we're effective, if we actually do a good job, as has happened in Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea. Uh, China has also seen a flattening of its number of cases. So if we do the social isolation for long enough to actually bend the curve, flatten the curve and keep people out of the emergency wards in our hospitals or the intensive care, we can probably have an impact on future waves. But if we don't do enough, um, there will be ongoing effects. And of course, even if we have kind of the, the best possible response to the first wave, there could still be a second wave because that is the pattern of past pandemics. That may f require us to go around the social distancing track one more time. All to say is that we don't really know. We, 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 we can anticipate kind of a, a U-shaped recovery where we're gonna, we've had a short drop already, we're looking for the bottom, uh, and then we'll recover at some point, ideally in, in the fourth quarter of 2020, but we're all kind of along for the ride uh, to see how bad this is gonna be. When the recovery happens, I'll reinforce this point, there's gonna be a real jump in demand because there's a lot of pent up consumer demand. Um, also a lot of businesses will be able to kind of flip the switch on their investment decisions. So. Uh, when the recovery happens, I would expect a quarter with growth of between four and five percent for at least one quarter, maybe two, then leveling off going forward. And of course, because things are so bad right now, both in terms of the public health front and the impact on the economy, our governments are, are jumping into this in, in a big way. Central banks are more or less signaling that they're going to go all in. They will cut interest rates to zero if they have to. They'll, they're providing for support for the financial system. They're doing pretty much the same thing they did during the global financial crisis uh, 10 years ago. They're turning on the taps, liquefying the economy, ensuring that there's no shortage of liquidity in any market segment. Um, fiscal policy is also now stepping up, and we've had announcements in both the U.S. and Canada this week of huge uh, fiscal stimulus programs and plans for bridge financing to try and help business through this very difficult period. And you, you can see action in terms of employment insurance, in terms of schemes to provide people with $2,000 as a bridge, that may well be useful as a wage subsidy to allow firms like yours to retain skilled workers at a time when you're, maybe your business demand is slipping a bit. And the bridge financing piece is really important, uh, whether it's from EDC, BDC, ACOA, uh, the banks themselves. So a variety of vehicles are, are being developed right now to ensure that liquidity is available for firms that are gonna get through this. Um, but we'll have to adapt, and nimbleness will be really important. Um, yesterday, a number of federal ministers were saying that it, a quick response is probably more important, that 
than a, a correct or accurate response, and I would agree with that. I think it's really important to signal to the public and the business community that we're doing things right now to kind of build a, a floor on the recession and ensure that we have a pathway back to recovery. And then modifications can, can be made as required to ensure that the gaps are closed and that the kind of adjustment is tailored to the real needs of the economy right now. Now, regional governments can also act, and we've seen announcements in Ontario, Alberta, and other places. The challenge, of course, in Newfoundland and Labrador is because the debt burden is so high, and because the provincial budget is dependent so heavily upon royalty revenues for about a third of revenues, there's going to be a deep hole anyway in Newfoundland, even without, without additional spending. So there may be limits to what the provincial government can do at this point. I'll come back to that in a second. Here's the likely scenario for me, having looked at all the forecasts and based upon sort of my, my own experience as a forecaster. I expect there to be a small contraction in Q1 because the, the fall has been so sharp in, in March. I then uh, anticipate that there'll be the deepest contraction in Q2, which is between April and June. And it could be from 3% to 5% to 8%. The building a floor will really depend upon how quickly we can get the stimulus cash out to ensure that individuals can, can pay their mortgage, pay their rent, keep food on the table, uh, that firms are able to retain skilled employees, that we have things that allow for bridging um, and, and sort of keep firms in operation. So how quickly the money gets out becomes an important factor, which would limit the contraction in Q2. Um, I, I think it'll be difficult given how little we know about the the waves of this particular pandemic to call for a recovery in Q3. So I, I, I anticipate there'll be further contraction, maybe a bit smaller, between one and 3%. And then ideally, you know, if we address the public health issues and have the right kind of tools in place in terms of uh, fiscal stimulus, we're gonna get a recovery in the fourth quarter of this year. And then growth next year will be good to great with much variation by region. So growth anywhere from two to three and a half percent is possible next year. Now, what about specifically for Newfoundland and Labrador? Um, the, your, your, the provincial deficit is going to grow and it's going to grow significantly because revenues are shrinking from ongoing business activity. So everything from personal income tax to business taxation to the royalties, which is a big chunk of revenue for the provincial budget, that's going to grow. So watch out for a very big deficit. I, I, I don't want to put a number on it, but it's not, it, it may even drift into the double digits. It may be that large this year. That will then add to the existing debt load of the province. And the fact that the provincial debt going into this was in the mid 50s as a share of provincial GDP means that it would be hard to advise the provincial government to add a lot of stimulus. So I think the right pathway for Newfoundland is to get close with the federal government and ensure that all the tools that they're developing are applied to the mass in the province. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be looking to federal voices working closely with provincial counterparts to ensure that support for individuals and for firms is being rolled out as quickly as possible. Uh, because the feds do have capacity to act and they've, they've shown, uh, I think, quite strong leadership. Uh, everything from the prime minister speaking every morning to the panel of, of ministers uh, you know, on, on the news channels, clearly they're taking this very seriously, a whole government approach. And they're stepping up as we expect them to right now. And as part of the dialogue with the federal government, I think Newfoundland also has to be very frank about its public debt situation and how it's going to manage that going forward. The Fed should be a partner. They don't want any ripple effects beyond the province. Um, I think words like uh, default should not be used. I, I think Newfoundland is still away from, away from that. But now is the time to have a conversation about how the debt burden is going to be managed, how the payment profile could be smoothed. It's a chance, for example, to take advantage of record low interest rates, to refinance if at all possible. Um, but that will be the one challenge that, that Newfoundland will have that other provinces won't have quite to the same degree. And then lastly, implications for you as, as, as businesses. Um, I think it's now pretty apparent that diversification of the customer base is really important. Um, I ran a business unit at the conference board for 12 years. And uh, we were very careful not to rely upon uh, only a small cluster of, of, of customers for activities. So we had a customer base that extended into hundreds of firms, selling a forecast, doing research for them, doing analysis. And that sort of mindset I think is very helpful as a way to, it's the same as your investment portfolio for retirement. Diversification is a good thing because a bad risk in one place doesn't cripple the entire portfolio. Right now, the private sector is clearly in turmoil. 
Um, so we shouldn't expect a lot of new sales uh, in the next uh, period to the private sector. <clears throat> Maintaining existing relationships and existing contracts is obviously job one. To ensure that you have the potential for follow-on business with those clients. Uh, on the other hand, government demand is, is, is going to grow. We're going to see a big boost in government spending. And if you can be part of the solution, providing technology that allows for better analysis, smoother delivery of products and services, um, that would clearly position you very well with, with, with the government clients. And for firms that are feeling the, the cash flow squeeze, if you're feeling like illiquidity squeeze, there is a number of programs being rolled out now by the by the federal government for small business. And you and, you and your colleagues may be able to access that. So we uh, look to ACOA, look to BDC if you have a relationship there. The banks are also gonna have to get very creative with support from the federal government. But clearly people would much rather restructure and find ways to, to sort of deal with a, a short-term squeeze than have to go through a, a much longer workout situation. So now's the time to be engaging with your financial partners if you have particular issues. And there may also be programs emerging to help you retain your skilled workforce. Uh, the, the federal government announced yesterday that they're changing a program they had announced just last week to provide up to $2,000 to individuals. That could well be the, the, the mechanism that would help you. So that could basically function as a wage subsidy to allow you to retain skilled workers and, and uh, it position yourself to still have an integral business model as you come out of this. Um, you should examine that through discussions with your provincial and federal counterparts. I'm gonna stop there. Th these are really extraordinary times. Um, it's painful to roll out a, a forecast where you even talk about a global recession in 2020. I think the next quarter is gonna be the worst, but I also think that we're now beginning to put in place the building blocks to actually have a recovery for the latter part of this year. And I thank you for your attention today.